I'm excited to be here in Birmingham. I, I was telling Joanna, I was walking around the building and it's bringing back so many memories. The stairwell still smells the same. <laughs> I had noops for dinner last night. I don't know why I picked that, but you know, that's what I wanted to eat. And you know, it brought back a lot of memories because I feel like I went to a lot of seminars where we were eating none but nukes. So, but I'm happy to be here talking about my work, um, which I'm very passionate about. Um, and also talking about my past, like after I left UAB and, you know, all the different steps that I, you know, that was taken after leaving Birmingham. So before I start my presentation today, I would like to say that I have nothing to disclose. And I always start my presentation with a positionality statement. Um, so I am trained as a nutritional epidemiologist and I have studied social determinants of health, um, specifically as they pertain to uh, dietary behaviors for the past 10 years. I will say that my experience and how I grew up in Atlanta, I grew up in a predominantly African-American, low resource community. And that definitely uh, is the reason why I do the work that I do when I work with the communities that I work with. But I understand the fact that I've had many opportunities in my life to advance my education. And that, because of that privilege, um, impacts how I view public health. It impacts how I view health equity and how I work with communities. So. I'm always like to start so you can understand a little bit more about me before you hear about my work. Okay, so um, first thing I want to do is start um, just giving you a little bit of background information about disparities in health access. So I don't know how um, many, how much you know people in the department understand about healthy food access in America and how important it is. But um, for decades, studies have reported geographic disparities in healthy food access in America. And I always like to say, and I like to underline affordable healthy foods because that's very important. You know, we can, you know, try to increase our efforts, our interventions and our initiatives to improve access to healthy food. But the fact of the matter is that they need to be affordable. They need to be culturally appropriate for the communities that we're working with so that, you know, um, they're having the impact that we want them to have. So, um, you know, but for years, entities like the USDA, they've been studying geographic disparities. And at this point, we have tons of data to show that majority minority, so majority African-American, majority Latino um, communities, low-income communities, as well as, as well as communities in rural areas, they tend to be disproportionately affected by disparities in access to healthy food. Um, I recently did a scoping review looking at the, um, the association between structural racism and access to healthy food. And I think I found over a hundred different studies that have documented geographic disparities at this point in time. And one of my take home messages was that we know the disparities exist and now we need to move forward past that. So um, limited availability of healthy food has been linked to a number of adverse health outcomes, including obesity, um, poor diet quality, um, food insecurity, chronic disease risk, and eliminating disparities in healthy food access has been a major priority um, at the local level, at the state level, as well as federal level when it comes to public health. We always see healthy people. You know, I think we're on Healthy People 2030 right now. And this is always a priority. And um, the fact of the matter is that USDA uh, data has showed that we've moved the needle, but we still have a lot of work to do. We've actually seen some communities um, who were, uh, who had poorer access to healthy food, they got work during the pandemic. I think the pandemic did one thing, which is expose um, a lot of the disparities that we had in America in terms of health and access to health resources. And in many cases, they made it worse, okay? So just understand that this continues to be a major health priority. But, you know, whenever we're thinking about coming up with initiatives, whether they're at the local level, they're at the state level, or they're at the federal level, you know, I feel like we as a community, especially in my field of public health nutrition, we need to have one shared vision or one shared goal. And I truly believe that our field right now, our shared vision right now is nutrition equity. OK, so nutrition equity is defined as ensuring all people and communities, regardless of their demographics, so regardless of the racial ethnic composition, religious composition, um, they have the necessary resources. They have the necessary systems and the necessary policies in place so that everybody living in that community can achieve and sustain a healthy diet. So that's the understanding of healthy, of um, nutrition equity. And we're really trying to focus on nutrition security, not just food security, okay? So food security mostly focus on um, 
making sure people have access to food, but we want to make sure we have people have access to food that supports their nutritional needs. And everybody's nutritional needs and nutritional preferences are different. So that's the fundamental vision behind nutrition security. So I truly believe that nutrition equity should be centered in all of our policies and all of our interventions when we're aiming to address nutrition disparities. So a lot of the work that I do looks at access to healthy food, food purchasing behavior, obesity, but there's other types of nutrition disparities as well, okay? But if the goal is to address these uh, disparities and, um, and um, alleviate them, the nutrition equity has to be rooted in everything that we do. But this will require one thing. It's gonna require all researchers in our space, all public health practitioners, all policymakers who work in this space to improve our understanding of the structural drivers of nutritional inequities. And that's where my research comes in, okay? So I'm interested in structural drivers, um, whether they're historical, whether they're current, I'm interested in social determinants of health. And more importantly, I'm interested in how these social determinants of health intersect with one another to influence our health. Okay. So I'm going to start with this framework. I love to show this framework whenever I'm giving presentations. So this is the Getting to Equity framework. I don't know if anybody in the audience has seen it before, but it was published in the American Journal of Public Health. Um, the author of it is Dr. Shriki Kumanika. So for anybody who doesn't isn't, isn't familiar with Shariki Kumanika's work, but she is a um, she is a well-renowned health equity scholar in public health. Okay, I kind of see her as like sort of the grandmother to all public health nutrition researchers. She was my postdoc's postdoc advisor at Cornell. Um, she retired from Penn um, a while um, a while ago, and now she's um, she's she's working at Drexel in Philadelphia, but. She wrote, the, she developed this particular framework. And the vision behind this framework is to give researchers who do obesity interventions, specifically obesity interventions, a guide to how to increase the equity impact of their work, okay? So it was developed around obesity, but since it has been published, I've seen many scholars adapt this particular framework to their interests. So I've seen scholars adapt this to focus on despair, uh, diabetes, adapted to focus on, um, uh, let's say school meals, school meal policy, but this one was developed to focus on inter, um, obesity interventions, specifically policy systems and environmental change interventions that um, have many, many components, okay? So the idea is that you have these particular interventions that you wanna focus on. Your intervention could be aiming to increase healthy options, Okay, so for an example, you want to improve healthy food retail. You want to um, and you want to improve the built environment, address issues of blight. You want to improve parks, recreations, transport, stuff like that. Another leverage point in terms of interventions would be to reduce deterrence. Okay, so you want to address the fact that there, you know, food might cost more money. There might be threats to personal safety, like crime, discrimination, social exclusion. So these might be the different points of intervention, or you might have a, your intervention for, might include many different components. And then the bottom quadrant, improving social and economic resources and building community passage, um, that's how you build the capacity. That's what you leverage to make sure that your intervention is successful, okay? So for an example, I might develop an intervention that um, introduces tax credits to organ, um, to, um, to um, businesses in low resources communities to give them an incentive so that they sell more healthy food. Okay. So that's the idea of this particular framework. And thinking this way and considering these different factors, many of them are social determinants of health, helps you understand um, the role of equity and think about it when you are developing your interventions. Like I said, this one was developed for um, obesity. Um, but again, it's been adapted in many different settings. So I would say my line of research right now, like my, my different lines of research, they focus on these first two quadrants, okay? I do a lot of work in the space of increasing healthy options. So I'm gonna talk about that first. And then I'm doing research focused on reducing the tenants, okay? And as I go, I'm gonna talk about a lot about how my training in epidemiology has positioned me to work with nutrition policy scholars, work with health equity experts, work with community leaders, to advance the work. And I, I, I definitely 
want students in the audience to understand that your skills, the training that you're getting in epidemiology and biostatistics translate well across many different areas of public health. So I encourage you, after you leave your program, to continue to build your skill set and make connections with people outside of um, this particular area of study, okay? Because it translates well when you are out um, and you're doing research, you know, because the type of work that we're doing, if we're going to move the needle to address health inequities, we really have to have a transdisciplinary approach. And we have to work with people who are doing, ex who, are, who are scholars outside of um, epidemiology, okay? All right, so I'm gonna start with increasing healthy options, okay? So there are many different strategies that you know, people in the field, public health nutrition, have you know, uh, implemented to try to expand access to healthy food and healthy food purchasing in America, okay? So I have a couple of different strategies here on the board. I'm gonna talk about, um, I'm gonna talk about one specifically, but I've had the pleasure to work on many of these different strategies throughout my training. So when I was a postdoc, after I left, um, after I finished my PhD in epidemiology here, I moved to Chicago because I wanted to study three things. I wanted to study nutrition policy, behavioral economics, and I wanted to study community-based participatory research. I wanted to add those to my skill set as an epidemiologist so I can, um, you know, study more upstream, these upstream instructional factors that, uh, that um, influence uh, health, particularly health in low-resource communities. So I was working on the Healthy Food Financing Initiative, which was actually a federal initiative. Um, to expand access to healthy food in America. It was actually implemented during the Obama administration. And the goal of that was to um, alleviate food deserts in America. So we were studying how opening new grocery stores in Chicago and neighboring cities was um, changing food purchasing behavior as well as dietary intake for community, uh, for community members, okay? So that was really a natural experiment. The Healthy Food Financing Initiative was something that we didn't control these grocery stores were opening and we were tracking, um, tracking the impact of them in Chicago. There's been other examples, like there's been one in Louisiana as well as one in uh, Pennsylvania, their fresh food financing initiative, but this is another, this is a really good strategy. Another strategy is a uh, food package revisions. So I don't know if, how many of you are familiar with the WIC program, but WIC is the largest um, uh, federal assistance program for women, for, for uh, pregnant women, postpartum women, and women with children under the age of five. And they had a major food package revision in 20, 2009, and they're going through another one right now that's going to be written into the farm bill, okay? But food package revisions is another way to expand healthy food access because if you are a retailer in America and you take WIC benefits, you have to, stat, you have to stock WIC food, okay? So if you, um, so if that's low, if that's low, uh, low fat milk, fresh fruits and vegetables, formula, so on and so forth, they have to stock it. So that's a way of expanding healthy food access. Minimum stocking requirements. I worked on that when I was living in Chicago, and that is something that was going through, was working through the SNAP program, which is food stamps. Uh, at the time, they were trying to increase the stocking requirements for stores that accept SNAP benefits. If you are a retailer and you take SNAP benefits, there's a minimum stocking requirement of healthy foods. And they've been trying to determine what's the perfect amount to make sure we have, we expand access to healthy food without making it too much of a burden on stores that participate. And the final is nutrition incentives. Nutrition incentives are wonderful because um, many of these programs are funded by the USDA, GUSNIP, and um, their GUSNIP program. And what they do is that they usually work through farmers markets or co-ops, um, but what they do is that they provide people a monetary incentive if you're experiencing food insecurity, if you are on the SNAP program, and it allows you to take on, take home more, um, it, it increases the purchasing power of your SNAP dollar, okay? So what I'm going to talk about is my work in nutrition incentives. Okay, so we're going to talk about the Link Match program. So Link Match is actually a USDA Gus Shoemaker Nutrition Incentive Program is funded by the USDA and it's actually based in Illinois. So the nonprofit organization in Chicago that actually has the Gus Nip program is called Experimental Station. And Experimental Station has had this program for about 15 years now, so it's been a while. And they get funding from the USDA to offer the Link Match program. So they get the grant and then farmers markets, co-op, grocery stores across the state of Illinois are able to apply to participate 
in this particular program. So what it does is that it provides people who are on SNAP um, a match of their dollars. So if you participate in the SNAP program and you come to a link match farmer's market up to $25, you can take home $50. So if you if you redeem up to $25 of your SNAP benefits, you can take home $25, $50 worth of fresh fruits and vegetables. It's double. Okay. This program is, this program has had, you actually can see the sort of impact that it's had in terms of reducing food insecurity, as well as the, the importance it is, you know, the importance of the program to the actual markets, okay? Because it, it actually supports a lot of the local growers, the farmers in Illinois, because they come to the markets and they actually get to take home like funding from this, from this Gus Nip program. So it's very, it's become very important to sort of the um, food system in many of the communities that have these programs. So since 2016, I've been the primary evaluation partner for Experimental Station. So as an evaluation partner, what I do is that I, I work with them in any of their research and evaluation needs, okay? So, you know, they've had a number of different projects. Um, for an example, at one point in time, they had a produce prescription program where they were looking at the impact of their produce produce prescription program on blood pressure, um, you know, uh, various different, um, you know, uh, biomarkers. So I help them with that evaluation. Um, one of the things that we do every year that's required for the USDA is that we have to do a statewide evaluation of the program. We collect data on food security status. We collect data on obesity status, chronic disease risk, food purchasing behavior, as well as program satisfaction. And we do that every year. We're actually getting ready for the 2023 evaluation and we're gonna we're gonna collect data from 20 different farmers markets, all SNAP participants. We'll be doing the data collection this year in English, Spanish, Mandarin, Chinese, as well as Russian. So I'm excited about that. That'll be that'll be new for us. Um, but one thing I will say is that as their evaluation partner is that I've learned a lot how again to translate my skills um, that I you know gained while I was at UAB to work alongside a community organization to conduct research every year on this particular program. Um, so it's been a very rewarding experience. So this is actually a link match locations in the city of Chicago. So I actually published a brief with my community partners. Um, actually everything that I write, I write with my community partners. So if that's something, you know, that's something that uh, I encourage you to do if you end up doing community-based participatory research after you leave this program is to, you know, learn how to work alongside communities learning how to share data, understanding like mutual goals, uh, their careers, your careers, and then, you know, also publishing and presenting your work alongside each other is very important. But in this particular paper, we actually looked at um, reach of link match in Chicago, as well as across the state of Illinois, because we wanted to see what communities it was serving and whether or not we had gaps in access. So in this particular paper, we were looking at gaps in access. And we actually saw that, you know, when it comes to, um, when it comes to the city of Chicago, that lower income communities, which are primarily located on the west side of Chicago and the south side of Chicago, they had access to the program. Um, however, we actually looked at, and I don't, I don't have all the maps because we have a lot of maps in the paper, but um, we actually looked at access to these um, locations in regards to a lot of different social determinants of health. So we looked at crime, we looked at walkability score, we looked at um, access to other food amenities, and we saw that majority lower income uh, census tracts in Chicago had access and majority black census tracts in Chicago had access, but also these markets were more likely to be in areas with higher crime. And this is the violent crime rate. And then I don't have the walkability map, but yes, lower walkability scores, lower access to physical activity amenities. So you can see that, you know, they're in communities where, um, like I said, these other issues like crime is something that's very relevant. And I'm going to pick up crime when I uh, transition to the next part of my presentation. But yes, also lower walkability, which is something that was very concerning for us because Chicago is a very walk, it's supposedly a very walkable city, okay, where many people, not as much as the city of New York, but a lot of people don't have cars, okay. So, you know, when it comes to uh, these sort of health, um, it, these amenities that are important to health, like pharmacies, grocery stores, um, clinics, so on and so forth, we want to make sure that they're in areas that are walkable and safe, okay? 
So, you know, we found we were looking at particular um, looking at important gaps in access, but then also thinking about where are our markets located so we can make sure we improve reach. OK, so that's one of the main goals that, you know, we've been thinking about. And, you know, as as different farmers markets and co-ops open, we want to think like, who do we want to target? Who do we want to bring into the link match program so people in that community have access to the program? This is just some information about um, participants in the link match program. So this is data from about 300 um, link match participants that was collected in 2017 and 18. Um, the, all of this information is published in a paper that we published back in 2020. But as you can see, um, most of the people that use this program are women, okay, actually older women. And we actually have, we actually tend to have a pretty good split in terms of race ethnicity. I would say in recent years, since we got the COVID relief funding, um, we've been able to put the Link Match program in more grocery stores that are more Hispanic serving. So the number of people that have been uh, interfacing with the program, other who are not black and not white, has increased substantially since COVID because we're able, we, we've been able to build partnerships with many of the co-ops and farmers markets in those communities. But this data, major, most of the participants are not Hispanic white and not Hispanic black. Um, and then, as you can see, body mass index, um, about 29, so on average obese. Um, and then you can actually see the number of participants who are consuming fruits and vegetables three or more times a day, and it's about 22% for both, okay? And in this paper, we were actually interested in looking at racial ethnic differences in food purchasing behaviors for our participants. And keep in mind, all of these participants are lower income because they're all participating in the SNAP program. Um, so we were interested in differences in fruit and vegetable consumption and differences in farmer's market shopping, uh, shopping behaviors because we were trying to think, okay, where can we put our efforts around nutrition education? Where can we, what markets do we need to partner and target when we're trying to um, increase the number of people coming to the markets? Um, so that's why we did this particular analysis and published this paper. So these are actually odds ratios looking at the odds of consuming any fruits and vegetables a day. OK, so that's the outcome. And the first two models are actually fruit, um, fruit intake. The model three and four are vegetable intake. So nine Hispanic white um, participants served as the reference group. So you can actually see lower odds of consuming fruits and vegetables. And we're just looking at one serving. OK, so we're not looking at um, meeting the actual national recommendations for servings. And after we adjust for, you know, market location, age group, gender, household size and frequency of actually shopping at farmers markets, we saw um, that non-Hispanic black participants had lower odds of consuming, uh, consuming fruits and vegetables, particularly fruit. And then the vegetable model wasn't significant after adjusting for the covariates. And then, and then for other, it wasn't. It was this, the other difference was significant after adjusting for co, um, for um, co, for covariates. And in this paper, we also looked at differences in frequency of shopping, and we actually did see that, um, you know, the barriers for our non-Hispanic Black participants were higher, like the amount of barriers that they said, you know, and we we asked about all different types of barriers, access to transportation, and when we were specifically asking them. Why are you not using the link match program or are you not using the link match program as much as you would like to and tell us why? OK, and many of them were telling us, OK, the hours of operations are a concern. And that made us think a lot about because this data is from 2017 and 2018. So the hours of operation barrier was really concerning for us, because, as you know, many farmers markets, they keep specific hours. They might only be open one day a week. They might only be open seasonally, especially in Chicago. We have one very short farmer's market season. It runs like June, July, August, and that's it. And it's pretty much the only time we get heat in Chicago. So um, after that, you know, they really don't have the access to this resource. And that's why it was very important for us to move it and start trying to figure out how we can work within systems for grocery stores um, to actually expand that. And a lot of the money we got through Gus Nip for COVID relief has allowed us to build out those systems. So a lot of the data that has come from 2022 and 2022 evaluation looks a little bit different from that. So we're working on some papers from that. So there's a lot of room for um, advancing the research on nutrition incentives. 
So one thing I will say about um, this particular strategy to expand access and purchasing of healthy foods is that um, studies have demonstrated the benefits of them. People who participate in these programs, they increase their um, fruit and vegetable consumption over time and it reduces their risk of food insecurity. And these particular programs, they do address key social and food justice issues in America, especially in communities that have experienced disinvestment um, for long periods of time. Um, however, the research around demonstrating the impact of these on overall diet quality as well as chronic disease risk is very limited. And I think a lot of it has to do with, um, you know, trying to get, trying to build cohorts of people who um, engage and actually use these resources so we can track these type of metrics. We can track blood pressure over time. We can track weight change over time. We can track, um, you know, diabetes risk over time, so on and so forth. So I think a lot of it has to do with us building the capacity around really evaluating these programs and, the USDA is trying to standardize this because prior to 2021, the USDA who funds these programs, they didn't have a standard for evaluation. Does that make sense? Like they didn't require programs like they're like they they have a produce prescription program line of funding. This is the nutrition incentive line of funding. Um, they have community access projects line of funding. They didn't require any of these funding sources to actually evaluate the, the outcomes. And now they're trying to standardize that. They actually have a national evaluation center. It's ran through Gretchen Swanson um, uh, and they actually standardize it. So they make us do an evaluation every summer, but still the data that they collect, it doesn't allow us to answer these questions. Looking at overall diet quality, which will require more sophisticated measurements for us to actually look at diet. We need to do like, you know, we need to do food frequency questionnaires. We need to do 24 hour recalls, that type of, we need to get that type of data. Um, and we need to get like, we need to, um, you know, cause a lot of times we're capturing people and getting their data when they're shopping. Okay. And the fact of the matter is that it's hard to get people to want to give you data when they have their kids and they're running in and out the farmer's market or the grocery store. Um, you know, people who study, you know, me and my colleagues who study food purchasing behavior is challenging, okay? Ch even trying to do intercept surveys at grocery stores to see what people are buying, when we can actually see their food and actually weigh it, measure it, you know, scan it, so on and so forth, is very difficult work, okay? So that's why I say there's a lot of room to grow this research. Um, and then additional research is needed on the structural barriers to program access, access and usage. Um, Yes, because all of these programs are ran by community organizations across the country in different states. Um, so, you know, kind of pulling everybody together so we can actually look beyond what's just going on in our communities. Um, you know, that's also a challenge. So, yes. Um, OK, so at this point, I'm going to transition to another area of research of mine, and that's reducing deterrence, which is something I've been spending a lot of time on in the last couple of years, because this is the focus of my KO1 research. Um, so we're gonna talk about crime. So you might be thinking like, why am I studying crime? <laughs> when I study um, when I'm uh, in public health nutrition, but actually this came out of my research um, when, I was, um, when I was living in Chicago. So like I said, I wanted to study community-based participatory research. I really wanted to understand, um, to get a stronger understanding of Okay, we have these resources. We have communities who have experienced disinvestment. You know, they don't have access to uh, amenities. They're they're pulling their efforts. They're opening co-ops. They're opening. Um, they're starting community gardens. They are starting CSA programs, and they're they're opening farmers markets. And I really want to understand what are the challenges of keeping them successful, financially successful over time in these communities so that they can continue to be a resource in these communities. And so I, I actually uh, did an analysis, it's qualitative, and I wrote a paper, um, and I was trying to understand the challenges and successes of running a farmer's market in a historically Black low-resource community in Chicago. So I got a chance to spend a lot of time with the managers, the people who are living in these communities who are doing this work, and one of the things that kept coming up was crime. And they were telling me, hey, you know, Chelsea, we've had to change our market location multiple times. 
We've had to think through our hours of operation, our day of operation, because the fact of the matter is that farmer's market season in Chicago overlaps with gun violence season in Chicago, because gun violence is the highest in Chicago in the summer, because that's when people are out and about the most. Gun violence rates in Chicago tend to drop in the wintertime because it's freezing and not a lot of people are out and about. There's not a lot of city events, so on and so forth. So because of that, that's been a concern. And they say, you know, we deal with, we, um, we, a lot of our clientele are elderly. And if they know that there was a shooting nearby our market, they don't want to come out to the market. So that made me think deeply about crime, which is a social determinant of health, just like access to healthy food. And think about all the social determinants of health, transportation, access to healthcare resources, and how all of them, in, that includes water security, housing security, and how all of them are connected to one another. And so, you know, that made me say, okay, I want to focus my time and attention and I want to study more about the public, well, really the nutritional implications of crime. So I decided to write my K01 project and luckily it was funded by the National Institute of Minority Health and Health Disparity and it's based in Chicago. And um, the goal of it is to actually really understand how crime affects food access, specifically food businesses and food purchasing behavior of lower income African-American families. OK, so crime is widely considered a public health concern. Um, there are many people who study crime, you need either as a predictor of adverse health outcomes or as as an outcome in itself, violence as an outcome in itself. And I'm focusing specifically on crime, even though you can widely look at violence. A lot of the work I've been doing, mostly in the space of violent crime, has been, been doing a lot of stuff on nonviolent crimes. Um, but yes, you know. Violence in itself is, is a very broad concept. There are so many different types of violence, domestic violence, so on and so forth. Um, but yes, we're going to talk specifically about crime, but it is a barrier to sustaining a healthy and active lifestyle. Okay, so crime rates in America have shifted a lot. You know, our crime rates in America are nowhere near as high as they were in the 80s and 90s. You know, we had a lot of social issues in America in the 80s and 90s while our crime rates were so high. You know, we had a pretty serious drug epidemic during the time period. Um, however, our crime rates in America have increased significantly. However, they've been kind of on the on a rise in the last uh, maybe five or so years. And a lot of that is driven by like we still have pretty serious crime rates in um, large urban centers. OK, Chicago being one of them. Now I'm living in New Orleans. And New Orleans says we're, we're I think we're in the top five right now in terms of crime in America and New Orleans. So um, even being in New Orleans for two years, I'm, I'm seeing the public health implications of the crime epidemic in New Orleans. So crime has been linked to a number of adverse health outcomes. So this is actually a paper that I published recently in the Journal of Urban Health with some of my colleagues at my old unit at University of Illinois who are kinesiologists. But we were interested in looking at crime in Chicago and how that's associated with physical inactivity as well as obesity, um, the prevalence in Chicago. And so these bivariate maps actually show you areas of the city in the darker colors that actually are in the highest for crime rate, but then also in the highest for obesity, which is the first panel, and then physical inactivity, which is the second panel. However, crime has been linked to a number of adverse health outcomes. It's been linked to, um, it's been linked to uh, poor mental health outcomes, depression and anxiety, uh, substance abuse. Um, but yeah, for this particular paper, we were interested in obesity and physical inactivity because um, the fact of the matter is that in areas where there are high rates of violent crime, people don't exercise as much. Um, that, you know, the, the association we see, a lot of it could be because people have fear. They, they perceive their environment as not as safe, so they don't want to go out, even if they have access to amenities. But then also, you know, crime is just another um, sort of proxy measure of like not having resources in itself. So it could just be a correlation. There's not as many physical activity resources or like they might have high levels of blight. There might not be safe parks or community centers for people to exercise. So, but yes. Um, and in this particular paper, we actually looked at, we actually did see a significant association between violent crime and um, this is the obesity prevalence. And we actually looked at the association by, by the racial composition of the communities. We actually saw a very strong association um, overall, but then a the majority black. And then we saw uh, 
uh, an association majority Hispanic communities, but not a majority white and racially diverse tracks. The challenging thing about this particular analysis is that um, really we, I wanted to look at, you know, racial composition at the intersection of income because Chicago is very racially segregated. It's actually the most racially segregated urban center in the United States. And it's not just racially segregated, it's also socioeconomically segregated. So we really wanted to, a lot of the work that I do, I try to compare um, tracks by so, within socioeconomic strata, if that makes sense. So comparing, um, you know, looking at racial disparities, but within socioeconomic strata, because ideally, you know, if we're looking at the highest income strata and that we do see racial disparities within that, that's a strong indicator of like very, of like more deeper structural issues if they have the same act, uh, the same um, income or education level, whatever marker of um, socioeconomic advancement you wanna study, okay? So, um, uh, so uh, like I said, a lot of the work I've been doing is looking at crime and access to food. OK, so this is a very complicated relationship between community crime and retail food environment. I'm going to talk to you a little bit about that. But um, there is theory, there is there is theory from the from criminology as well as theory from economics about how crime retailers may how food retailers may be actually crime attractors. OK, and the reason for that is because many of them keep very long hours, many of them work with minimal staff. And I feel like that's definitely something that has changed a lot. We see stores, especially stores that are smaller formats. So smaller format stores are your dollar stores, your liquor stores, your pharmacies, your corner stores, and how many of them don't keep as many employees. Um, they don't keep a lot of employees. They also have limited security, but they keep a lot of cash, okay? So they tend to be these points of opportunity for crime. OK, so um, that's the theory behind how food retailers may be crime attractors. And there's literature that has shown that there are specific food retailers that tend to attract violent and nonviolent crime more than other types of retailers. And the one that I would say the most that we have literature on are corner stores, dollar stores, liquor stores, as well as super centers. Super centers are outlets like Walmart and Target. OK, so it's interesting. Um, Walmart and Target have been a topic of conversation around crime for a while, um, mainly because of um, mainly because of a lot of the gray literature, a lot of the mainstream media that has come out a lot about these particular outlets. Um, they are also another outlet. They they are not a small format store. They are a very large format store. However, they tend to have like when you look at the ratio of the square footage of the store compared to the number of employees and the amount of security that they have, they tend to have a lot of nonviolent crime and because of that. And a lot of it is because, again, looking at the balance between the two. OK, so um, one of the things that me and my partners did um, recently was that we did an analysis looking at food retailer availability and violent crime rate in America. And this is actually at the county level. So we got data from the FBI and we got data from the USDA. The USDA has a lot of data um, available on um, food access disparities as well as um, location of food retailers in America. So one of the things we wanted to look at was actually um, to see if there was an association. So we looked at a number of different retailers. We looked at grocery stores, super centers, convenience stores, fast food restaurants, and full service restaurants and farmers markets. I actually don't have the results for we actually did a, um, we actually looked at the modified retail food environment index, which is a score of the overall healthiness of a, of a geographic area. It's like an index score that actually shows how healthy a community is. So we actually looked at that there in the paper as well. So I encourage you to take a look at it if you're interested. But what well, we were interested in seeing if there was a significant association. So we actually saw among all US counties, super centers, fast food restaurants, full service restaurants and farmers markets, were associated with violent crime rate. Super centers were associated with increased violent crime rate. You know, the uh, we see that the uh, the, um, the beta was actually positive. So that means that as super centers increase in availability, that means the violent crime rate increases. Full service restaurants and farmers markets were negatively associated. So, like say for farmers markets, as they increase in the county, the uh, the farm, uh, the violent crime rate decreases. Okay. We actually looked at associations stratified by metro county status. 
Um, using this data source, Metro County status is a proxy for urban rule. So Metro is like urban areas, non-Metro is rural, more rural areas. And we did see some differences. Uh, for an example, in non-Metro areas, fast food restaurant availability was actually associated with increased risk of, or increased, uh, the, a higher prevalence of um, violent, um, violent crime. And then for grocery stores and urban centers, like more grocery store availability was associated with lower um, uh, violent crime rate. So, and all of these spatial regression models are adjusted for percent non-Hispanic Black, percent Hispanic, the poverty rate, as well as um, for the overall model, all counties is also adjusted for metro, metro county status, okay? Um, this is not a research, this is not my own research, but I wanted to highlight this particular study because it looks at it a different way. And this is actually some of the work that um, I'm doing with my K with some of the the city of Chicago data that we're cleaning and analyzing. So this particular study was done by Joe Gittleson's team at Johns Hopkins, and they actually developed this sort of conceptual framework to show the potential relationship between neighborhood disorder. And one of the factors that they studied in neighborhood disorder was actually crime to help you understand how neighbor disorder, how neighborhood disorder can negatively over time influence um, a, a food environment. So what they were interested in was looking at the long-term um, Im implications of violent crime on the food environment. So they looked at a longitudinal association. So they actually modeled violent crime rate from 2000 to 2012 to see if it was associated with food swamp score. Food swamp score is another measure of the overall healthiness of a food environment, but it's not looking at healthiness, it's actually looking at unhealthiness. So for food swamp score, the higher your swamp score, that means the more, that means you have more unhealthy retailers, if that makes sense. You have like more corner stores, you have more liquor stores relative to healthier retailers that sell a full line of groceries like um, grocery stores, so on and so forth. So they actually talk about some of these um, and these potential, this potential pathway. So they talked about um, the neighborhood social disorder and how that influence that can negatively influence social ties in communities. It can, it can it can increase fear among community members. And one of the one of the things that it does influence is owners' perceptions of the community, the decision making around what goes in that community. Okay, so for an example, people put businesses in communities where they think they're going to thrive. Okay. So that's why we see certain communities that have an overabundance of liquor stores or an overabundance of fast food restaurants or an overabundance of, um, of corner stores, because that's how investors and people who want to open in that community, um, that's how they perceive the community. And unfortunately, a lot of communities of color, especially Black communities, they don't have as high ownership of the businesses in that particular community. So the people who come in the community to, to open businesses, that's how they see the community. So they make decisions around their business because of that. So they have to think about the cost of running a business and what's going to be successful in that community long term. So there's a lot of costs that comes with running a business in a high crime community. They have to take on more insurance. They have employee turnover. They have to, you know, think about the security measures and so on and so forth. And then sometimes, you know, they just say, hey, you know, we don't want to deal with this. So you see a lot of business turnover in communities. So ultimately, like I said, that affects their decision making, decide decision to open, close the retailer type, what they stock in the store. And then that can in turn, over time, if violent crime rate is increasing in a community, it can result in a, a community becoming more of a food swamp over time. Does that make sense? So they actually saw with their longitudinal data that an increase in violent crime rate was associated over time with increases that trajectory in food swamp score in Baltimore communities. So this is some of the things that I'm doing with our data in Chicago. We're still in the process of cleaning it. I have data from 2010 to 2020 for the city of Chicago, but I'm not just looking at food swamp score. I'm looking at the availability of different types of retailers. I'm also looking at business turnover over time in communities. Um, and I'm looking at um, modified food retail environment index, which is actually a measure of overall healthiness. So, okay. And then this is another study I wanted to highlight. 
um, because this was actually done in LA and it's actually very interesting because they actually tracked violent crime in LA and they actually looked at park usage. Um, so one of the things that they wanted to know was that, you know, after major shootings and incidents, community crime, did that affect people's usage of community amenities like parks, trails, so on and so forth. And they actually did see a significant decrease in usage of these particular green spaces after there was a major gun-related violent crime incident. So that actually shows, they actually have data that actually shows um, that yes, crime does affect how people interact with the amenities and the resources in their communities. However, I feel like in the space of nutrition, particularly nutrition-related amenities, there's just not a lot of research. So there's a lot of opportunities to advance research on crime and nutrition. So I have a couple of papers out. I'm actually writing a commentary that's about to get published. Well, I wrote the commentary. It's about to get published in the Journal of Academy of Nutrition and Dietetics, actually looking at the inter historical, historical data, the interconnectedness of crime and nutrition. I actually talk about the data in the literature dating back to the 80s that actually showed how nutrition and what people were consuming was associated with violent behavior and how that segues into where we are in 2023, looking at social determinants of health. But there's a lot of different work that can be done. So I encourage anybody who's interested in this topic to join me because I'm kind of sitting on an island by myself right now. Um, but yes, you know, I want to know how crime influences food business practices, their long-term viability, how it's associated with food purchasing behavior, which is something that I'm going to be doing in New Orleans, um, and then looking at how crime impacts risk of household food insecurity. So yes, I'm working on this now, and hopefully this leads to um, an R01 where I'll be doing more of this research in New Orleans. So but yes, I want to stop here so I can take a few questions. Um, but yes, I want to acknowledge all of my colleagues. I have a wonderful, wonderful team of people around me. Dr. Winata at Mississippi State, she's a health geographer. One of my training aims for my K is actually spatial analysis. So I've actually, um, in space, you know, spatial epidemiology. So I've actually, uh, I've actually done a lot of work to actually increase my understanding of that. Another something, another skill set that I highly encourage uh, people who are in the EPI program to, you know, develop, especially if you're interested in environment, built environment, having like that skill set of spatial analysis is really good. I have some wonderful PhD students, great mentors. I want to acknowledge my community partners, Corey and Connie at Experimental Station, who have been very supportive of my career since 2016, as well as my funding. So thank you. So if you have any questions, you can email me or follow me on Twitter.